This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. This is Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And for those who know, that, sh- that song comes as a theme song from the movie Rocky. And which, why this show is very, very important. You know, the question is, are you living up to your full potential? Are you using everything you got in this lifetime? But another way of looking at this whole thing, uh, I just love our next guest. We have two guests. And the next guest is David Goggins, G-O-G-G-I-N-S. He wrote a book called Can't Hurt Me. And the reason this book is the perfect book at this perfect time is personally, I am sick and tired of the snowflakes our school system's putting out. And I don't really know what a snowflake is because as a former Marine, we had other words to call snowflakes. But I think it's more politically correct to use snowflake because I can't believe it. They have to have safe rooms. You can't say something that hurts somebody's feeling. I, what happened to the young people? What's happening to our academic system that we're producing a bunch of snowflakes? I can't stand it. So our guest today is the perfect guest at the perfect time in history. His name is David Goggins. The book is Can't Hurt Me. And joining me today is Rich Dad Advisor Josh Lannon. He's a Rich Dad Advisor. He's co-founder of Warriors Heart Treatment Center. He's the author of The Social Capitalist, Passion and Profits, and Entrepreneurial Journey. But the reason Josh is on this program too is because he is, he's the person that actually treats many of the warriors in our society but he is a warrior himself. I mean, he's done more on this end of personal development or being strong on the inside because we have a bunch of cream puffs coming out of our school system right now and our academic school teachers are producing them. I mean, what the heck's going on? So anyway, David, welcome to the program. I appreciate you guys for having me. Thanks again. Thank you. And Josh, welcome to the program. Thank you, sir. Great to be on the show again. Yeah, Josh, let me ask a quick as on let David here. What do you think of snowflakes? What do you think about what our schools pumping out here? <laughs> uh, I love the politically correct term snowflakes, right? Basically, <laughs> but I don't know if we can say that now. But you know, it's interesting. My son, uh, at an early age, we're talking six years old, when he was disrupted in school, they would call the police on him. <laughs> That's how far it's gone. It's like, are you kidding me? Why is there an officer here at the school for a six-year-old? That's how crazy the system is. And I told Josh, I'm proud of his son. <laughs> <laughs> so, David, let me ask you this. You know, you're, Give us a little bit of your background. But, I, again, I want to really, really thank you, commend you, and you're the perfect guy with the perfect book at the perfect time in our wimpy-ass society. And you can swear if you like. I mean, I don't really care. My company cares, but I don't really care. So I, I'd rather have you speak frankly and say what you have to say. But what was, what, first, let me ask a quick question. What do you think of these snowflakes our schools are pumping out? You know what, I, I don't have the words for it, but um, if I grew up in this day and age, if I was a millennial or whatever they call them nowadays, I, there would be no David Goggins. No one ever have heard of me. So, I'm I'm very blessed that I grew up in the in, in the time frame that I did because there is no mental toughness, there is no self discipline. Everybody gets a trophy, and and I, I hate to say it, but you're gonna lose in life. <laughs> you are going to lose in life, and and that's what makes you a an absolute winner by the fact that you are gonna lose in life. So I mean, we're doing these kids a, 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 a huge injustice. And um, I mean, I could talk about this for days. And and, and so what, so let's let's tell us your background. I mean, I'm glad I'm, I, I am I'm absolutely sincere, my friend. You're the right man at the right time with the right message, because we need you to say what you're saying. So give us your quick background and why you wrote "Can't Hurt Me" and your your career as a Navy SEAL, but what it made you, how the SEALs turn you into David the David Coggins of today, and who were you before that? Well, I hate to give the SEALs no credit at all. I give them a little bit of credit. But, <laughs> good, you know, good. But, but not very much. Um, 
And everybody goes, oh, my God, you're a Navy SEAL. That's, that, you know, you know that's, that's why you're a badass. But think about this. If you don't have what it takes when you go to Navy SEAL training, you quit. So what that means is your parents, life, yourself, you better have yourself prepared before you get to Navy SEAL training because they don't make you a Navy SEAL. You have to go through BUDS, and if you don't make it through BUDS training, SEAL training, you just quit. So you have the right stuff before you get there. They may get a stone, and they may chisel that stone into a great warrior, but you have the warrior mindset while you're there, before you get there, all through training, because if you don't, you go away. So right. I don't give the SEALs that much credit. I give life, society, life kicking my asked before I got there. I went through buds a million times before I went through actual buds. So, so, t- so uh, tell us tell us about, you know, it started with weight, right? I mean, because a lot of people out there in the world just know, well, you know, I'm, I'm only about 30 pounds overweight. and right. But that's where you started at 106 pounds or something overweight. Right. I was 106 pounds overweight, um, and I had about three, a little bit less than three months to lose all that weight to even try to be a Navy SEAL. But to back up on that, you know, you talk about this soft generation. Um, I, I grew up from a very abused childhood. My dad beat the hell out of me. My dad was an alcoholic. Um, I had a horrible foundation growing up. I had no self-esteem. I stuttered. I had patches of hair falling out. I didn't know right from wrong. I didn't go to school. I had a learning disability. I moved to a small town from, from Buffalo, New York, to a small town in Brazil, Indiana. While there were a lot of people there that liked me, my field of view was very small. So 1995, the KKK marched in the 4th of July parade. And just so you all know, I'm black. You know, for those of you don't know who David Goggins is, I'm a black guy. So, <laughs> you know, so um, you know, I was uh, one of five black kids in my school. I got called all the time. I had a fourth grade reading level my junior year in high school. I, I, I lied. I cheated. I, I hid out. I had no self-esteem. I had no pride. I had no dignity. I had nothing. I had nothing, but no one came to save me. I didn't win a trophy for getting F. I, you know, I, I was a bad student, and people told me I was a bad student, and people told me I was going to be a failure, and I was going to be a loser. While those words were harsh, you have two options when you have those words in front of you. Either sack it the f- up, or else to go be a f- and go hide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you hurt so, my feelings, sir. <laughs> right. So basically, and, and, and once again, I'm not a tough guy. I'm I, so so. I'm not a tough guy. I realized I had to become a tough guy to succeed in society. So you know. So basically, I I had to pass the uh, military uh, test three or four times to get into the mil- You know, to get into the Air Force. I got in the Air Force. Wanted to be Air Force pararescue. And realized. I wasn't great in the water. I, I, I sucked in the water, so I taught myself how to read and write. I finally passed the ASVAB test. I get some self-esteem. I get in the Air Force at 19. I don't make it through pararescue training. Um, it's a long story, but it's all in my book. I, I go from 175 pounds to 297 pounds in four years. I get out of the Air Force. I'm spraying for cockroaches at a company called Ecolab making $1,000 an hour, or or my fault, a a month, not an hour, a month, making $1,000 a month, um, no education pretty much, low self-esteem for several, several months. I'm just doing this job. Come home, and I watch the show on Discovery Channel. There's a lot in between here, and in the book he tells all of it, but I'm I'm just cutting to the chase. And um, I was haunted. I, I was being haunted every single day of my life for 24 years of the piece of shit I was. And, you know, basically, a lot of people called me names. A lot of people did this. A lot of people did that. But I was my biggest bully. It wasn't everybody else's problem. It was my problem. And I realized I had to face the demons. And that's kind of how it all started. So, uh... You saw, you watched the Discovery Show. Was that was that when you saw some documentary on the Navy SEALs? Yeah, I'm not for sure if it was Discovery Channel or History Channel, but uh, basically, yeah, I was watching TV. 
I came home from work at 7 o'clock in the morning. I worked from 11 o'clock at night to 7 o'clock in the morning. I came home, turned the TV on, and I was like, shit, man. And I was afraid of the water. And all I saw was these Navy SEAL wannabes just in and out of the Pacific Ocean. And also in the pool, you know, getting, getting put on the pool, you know, losing their breath. Some of them passing out. And it just looked miserable. And the guys were just quitting left and right. And I just couldn't get this image out of my head of me being one of those quitters. Whenever something got tough, whenever something got hard, I didn't have the resolve. I didn't have the intestinal fortitude to drive on past my self-perceived limitations. Every time something got harder, I became lazier and lazier and more pathetic in my mind, unable to find the right juice mentally to overcome myself. So I basically put myself in a incubator and said, either you're going to make it through this shit or you're going to die, but this is it. Well, I tell you what, man, you know, it's like you say, you went to war with yourself. And for all of you listening out there, I think we all can relate to that because I know I go to war with myself when I wake up in the morning and say, am I going to go to the gym or am I going to have some Cocoa Puffs? You know, many people choose the Cocoa Puffs, right, David? Oh, uh, uh, Most of them do. I mean, shit, I, I want to choose them. I mean, that's the thing about it. People think that this is something that's... Uh, Every day, oh, it must be a routine for David. Yeah, it's a routine, but the routine goes like this. I wake up, I feel sorry for myself, I don't want to do it, and I say, hey, you're being a sack of the fuck up, let's go. That's so going, it's that's, not something that, That's going okay. to war with yourself, right? Going, going, exactly. going to war with the, weaker, the weak person in you. That's right. Josh, anything you want to say about this? Because you've gone through some of the, the SEALs training, right? Well, it was with Rob Roy. It was a, just a, a four-day uh, experiential training, and they kicked her ass down on the grinder. But nothing like I'm going through Hell Week three times like you did, David. So I commend you, man, for having that uh, mental toughness just to keep going back, even when it's, when you're out for medical reasons or whatever, just to keep going back, man. That's huge. And uh, the battle, man, it's every day what's going on between my ears. That is the biggest war I think a lot of us face. I know I do. Uh, it's like, get right. up, let's move, let's go. And the loser in me wants to stop and wants to sabotage it. And it, it's a constant battle. So, man, I, I'm, I really commend you for uh, facing that demon and not letting it win the battle. And, and uh, David, one more I, thing. I, from this, from, I, I, I apologize. I listened to your book. I didn't read it. And I've watched I watch you on London Real with Brian Rose. You know, it's fantastic. Pro, what you, your message is so powerful because it hits at the core. But a lot of times what I picked up, one of the ways you got through buds and the Navy SEAL and things is you chose to make it harder, not easier. I mean, what, right. was, was that the way you got through a lot of times the, the – you know, with the boats and all that, you said, I want the hardest part of this job. I don't want the easiest. And I'll, I'll have to admit this, you know, I always choose the easiest, and that's one of my big downfalls. Right. Well, for me, um, the reason why I did that is I realized that I wanted to also choose the easiest. And this is the mindset behind me. If I'm going to go through the hardest training, I want the hardest spot in the worst position in the hardest training in the world. Because what that does is, if my mindset is going to the hardest place, like, like, like in, uh, in Hell Week, when you're carrying the boat, the toughest spot to be in is the number one spot. It's the heaviest part of the boat, and I never left that position. Because the more your mind searches for a comfort, any kind of comfort, it will continue wanting to find more and more of it. But the way I train my mind is, I want to find the hardest location known to man. And, if, and then my mind continues to go that way versus the other way. Because once you start giving yourself a way out, oh, you know what, I'm going to run five miles today. I'm going to run four miles. You know, for me, it's like, no, I'm going to go the opposite way. So my mind continued to get harder and harder and harder because I knew the second I gave it a way out, it was going to take it. And I also wanted to choose the hardest way because 
it was my way of motivating people. So how I motivate people is, is I was a broke crew leader going through all my hell weeks. And how I motivate people is give me the suckiest mother thing on the planet Earth and watch me excel. Watch me excel. And I won't say a the words here, but when you see me broke down, up, legs broken, and I go back to the number one spot on that fucking boat, and it's the heaviest thing known to man, you're going to look at me and say, Roger that. Let me follow this guy. So I do shit by example. I do the hardest shit so the people following me say, yeah, that's where I want to be behind that mother right there. <laughs> I tell you what, man, I, I am, um, I don't know what to say. I, I just thank you for saying what you're saying because I need to hear it, you know. So we're going to take a break, but when we come back, you know, I was, I was listening to your uh, interview with Brian Rose on London Real, and you said a couple of things. You know, one of, we talked about you go to war with yourself, and I, I think we go at, to war with the weak part of ourselves. Inside all of us is, a, is what I call the wimp. I'm the wimp. I'm right. the victim. I'm the. I'm. Oh, I can't do it. Oh, I don't. I, I'm. I'm good enough. But you also said something that just hit me between the eyes. Is because, you know, in my life I'm fairly successful, but success doesn't mean I'm proud of myself. Right. And you said something <laughs> about that, and I went, "Oh my God," because the truth is, for me, is that I am successful. I'm not proud of myself, and there's a very fine line in those statements. So when we come back, we'll, yeah. be, we'll be talking with David Goggins, G-O-G-G-I-N-S. His book is Can't Hurt Me. And in this world of snowflakes and our school system pumping out snowflakes, I won't say it because my company won't allow me to swear of all things. But anyway, we're going to be talking about how you can bring out the warrior inside of you instead of the snowflake. And we'll be back again with Josh, and we'll talk you more about how there is a warrior a Rocky, a person that you, you could be very proud of inside of you. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. You can listen to the Rich Dad Radio Show anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android. And all of our programs are archived at therichdadradio.com, at richdadradio.com. We archive that for one reason, is because we're an educational show. We don't make recommendations to buy or sell this or do this. And one of the ways we learn is via repetition. So if you like what you've heard on this, if you're the snow, if there's a snowflake inside of you that's kind of quiver right now, this would be a great program to listen to once again, and especially with friends, family, and fellow snowflakes you're in business with. Our guest today, our guest today, are Josh Lennon, is Rich Dad Advisor, co-founder of the Warriors Heart Treatment Center. He's the author of the Rich Dad Advisor book, The Social Capitalist: Passion and Profits: An Entrepreneurial Journey. Josh's website is warriorsheart.com. Our very special guest is David Goggins. His book is Can't Hurt Me. Please get this book because we all have that snowflake inside of us. And David, let me just say this. You know, I used to go down to Downwinds. I was, a, I was stationed at Camp Pendleton in the 70s. And I, 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 we didn't even know what the, we didn't know what Downwinds and, you know, what Coronado did. And the Marines, the, the Marines were so full of ourselves, we thought we were the best. And then in 1972, I, I flew the gunship out in out in Vietnam, and uh, I had the great pleasure of crashing on the back of an LPD one night. And so I was stuck on and broke my back and everything on board the back of this ship, and I was still full of myself. And so here's my broken down Huey sitting there all torn up because I had a dual hydraulics failure. I should have been dead. And then these guys come out, and I go, my co-pilot and I were going, who are those guys? And we kept saying, who are those guys? Who are those guys? And it was these guys jogging around my helicopter because it was broken, it didn't stop them from jogging. They kept jogging for hours. And then they open up, <laughs> their, they open up their boxes, and they're not carrying issue, you know, Marine Corps issue weapons. They're carrying very special weapons like the stoner and stuff like this. I'm going, holy mackerel. And we kept saying, who are those guys? And we go to dinner and these guys sh show up for dinner, they disappear, and then I come back for breakfast, we come back in, they come back in 
for breakfast shot to hell. They got mud, blood, guts, everything all over. They sit down to have breakfast in silence, and they go back to the rooms. While I was nestled sweet in my bed, these guys are out killing people. So I kept, I said, right. so I kept saying, well, who are those guys? And the, the, the Navy guy said that they're called SEALs. I went, what the hell is a SEAL? And that was a, <laughs> that was the first time I ever, you know, I think it was Mar- Marchansky or something, that guy. You know, they, they went. Yeah, Marchenko. Marchenko. They went ashore, then they're, 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 they were supposed to pick up a NVA general, and they missed him, so they went to secondary and tertiary targets. They blew up a bridge, got into a firefight, came back, and had breakfast. <laughs> went, Who are those guys? So it, it was, and, and the reason I'm honored to be talking to you as a Marine, we thought we we're pretty good. We we're pretty tough. But you guys took tough, you know, run. You, you took it to a whole nother level. I never forgot right. that. So that's why in today's world of snowflakes, your book can't hurt me. And your message is so needed. Any comments on that, Josh, because you deal with a lot of these warriors coming back, right? We do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're an inpatient treatment center for guys that are struggling for active duty and veterans, first responders with addiction. A lot of these guys get blown up and they get spun up on uh, pain meds and then they can't shake it. Um, So, you know, with the snowflake side of it, not with our warriors, but with the snowflake side of it, is that they run to drugs and alcohol a lot instead of dealing with the pain, instead of leaning into the pain. So with our guys, it's like, hey, man, I'm leaning into the pain. I'm doing everything I can, but I'm still struck with this addiction. So what we do, is, which is different than any other treatment center that I know, is that we embrace the warrior. It's like, hey, man, you're in a war. This, you're, you're fighting for yourself. It's in your own mind. We, so we train them, and we have our courses designed around a training course because it's familiar to them. And we don't turn our back on the warrior. We embrace it because that's who we are as a core. We don't say, hey, hang up your guns, let's sing kumbaya around the fire, and turn into hippies. That's just that's not us. So, yeah, I mean, um, love what we do, and it's a huge, huge problem in our, our veteran community. So, David, what would you like to say to all the snowflakes out there? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not politically correct anymore. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm just, I was telling a Rodney Dangerfield joke. I mean, you know, the guy says, you can't say that. I went, oh, no. Oh, no. Well, oh, no. <laughs> I can't even tell a joke. You know what I mean? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of funny you say that. I have, a, uh, I have an Instagram account, and, and I... And I'm as raw as I can possibly be, and a lot of people hate it, a lot of people love it. But the only way you're going to fix yourself from being a snowflake, from being soft, from being a weak person, is honestly, you have to be really raw. I invented this thing years ago called the accountability mirror. And it's how you, it's how you cure the uh, snowflake epidemic. You, you put yourself in front of a fucking mirror, while you're getting ready for work or school or whatever the fuck you're doing. And only you know how fucked up you are. We can lie to everybody. You can lie to your girlfriend. You can lie to your boyfriend. You can lie to people at school. You can't lie to yourself. So what I did was I lied so much and I was so insecure growing up is that how I cured my snowflake is I got in front of a mirror with just me and my pathetic self and I started writing sticky notes all over this mirror about how f***ed up I am, about what I need to change about myself, about how real um, I need to attack my life, the situations that I'm facing, the situations I'm afraid to face, and start to man up. And, um, but i tell you right now, um, it's not getting any better right now. This, this, this world, especially in the U.S., we are, we are soft as soft can be. You can't say a f***ing thing. Everybody gets offended. Everybody's got every f***ing movement going on, knowing the man. It's just, um, you know, everybody's so f***ing thin-skinned. And you don't get better that way. You just get worse. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Comments, Josh? <laughs> Spot on, man. <laughs> it really is. Everyone gets an award and everyone gets a sticker. And if not, you're the bad guy. 
Yeah. Hey, uh, David, what is the calloused mind? I mean, I think that, you know, this, this guy used to say to me, weak mind, weak body. Right. You know, I mean, the, when I so, see, when I, when I, when I, when I see, uh, you know, we, we had, you know, we had, a, we had, Marine Corps had very vicious names for anybody who was overweight and it wasn't pleasant. But without that, you know, you're not held accountable to yourself at that point either. You know what I mean? We call them Pillsbury right. Pillsbury Doughboys and, you know, Marshmallow Man. And it's harsh. It's harsh. Right. And then, and I look around and I was down at Costco the other day. Oh, my God. I couldn't believe what I saw walking down the aisles, you know? Holy. Oh, yeah. And they all have yoga pants on too, men too. Okay. Holy oh, yeah. moly! <laughs> Holy moly! But it's not a pretty sight, you know what I mean? And, right, and, right. And here they're here they're like ninety five pounds overweight, and they're stuffed into this. They look like a pork sausage walking down the aisles, and I'm going, "Holy mackerel!" And they're proud of it. Oh yeah. Well, I understand that mentality also, which is why I I do talk a lot of shit because I understand both sides of the spectrum. Um, callous mind comes from, when, when you think of callous, you think of tough. You think of, for me, um, I broke the Guinness Book of World's Records for the most pull-ups in 24-hour period. I did 4,030 pull-ups in 17 hours. Jesus. And, and in training for that, it took me nine months. I failed it twice before I finally got it the third time. But it's 67,000 pull-ups in nine months in preparation to break the record. Jesus. During that, during that time frame, what happens is this. Your hands are the only contact point that you have while doing pull-ups. Your hands become extremely f***ing callous. Calluses are a protection. So, in my life, I realized when I was growing up, I was the biggest f*** of all time. But I had two different sides. I had a very fake side that acted real tough and hard and nothing bothered me. But the real me was just a lazy, pathetic, everything hurt me piece of shit. And as I was growing up, I became a student of my mind, a student of my weak mind. I said, look, man, I wasn't a good student at all because I was lazy, but I wanted to figure myself out. So I was like, you know what, I have to figure this shit out. So, like, if I can callous my mind, callous it to the point where things wouldn't hurt me anymore. Like, if someone called me and if I, if I, you know, whatever was going on in my life, my dad beating me, my mom not, you know, you know my, my mom not being around, me having learned disabilities, me stuttering, whatever went on in life, I had to be the mother that could take anything, that could carry any cross, two or three crosses. As many crosses, so I developed this callous mind, a, a man that can walk through a fire and not get f***ing burned, who can take words and not say six and stones may, may break my bones. No, words hurt. But I want to get to a point where nothing hurt me. So I started to develop myself. I developed myself. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about fame. It wasn't about women. It was about I have to have so much f***ing pride in myself that nothing can hurt me, you, you know, can't hurt me. So basically what I did was I said, how am I going to do this? I'm going to have to literally start doing things I don't want to do and doing them to the best of my ability because that's where I started gaining this mental edge. I started realizing life isn't about all this bullshit. Life is about one thing, being proud of the person you see in the mirror. And once that started happening, the mind started callousing. And the more the mind started callousing, the more people couldn't f*** with me anymore. And I became unstoppable mentally. Thank you. Josh, any comments to that? Yeah. David, is that where you talk about being driven? Because, I mean, we have, like, I have moments of motivation, but to be driven is a completely different animal. Yes. So I often talk about this. Um, a lot of people out here are motivated. But you know that, that heat wave that kind of came through, you know, a couple of days ago, it was real hot as shit. Um, this is how I look at it. I'm not saying go outside and have a heat stroke. 
But when there's bad days, let's say let's say you're a runner. If you're a runner, most runners, you know, they, they like to run where it's perfect. You know, it's great condition, things are good, and that's that's when you're the highest motivated. You're motivated usually when life is good. When life is good is where people feel really jazzed up, they have great ideas. But then once life isn't so good, you have an argument with, you know, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your husband, your wife. You know, you're kind of tight for money. The boss is in your ass. You might have gotten fired. That motivation is fucking gone. But I started realizing that motivation comes and goes like the fucking wind. I said, I can't have that. I have to have a consistency. No matter what life throws at me, I have to have a consistency to where I'm continuously fucking life up. On a regular basis, I am fucking life up no matter what's going on in my life. If I'm sick, if I'm broken, if I have no money, if I'm going through a divorce, if my kids hate me, I have to be able to attack life. So I realized we have to become driven. We have to become obsessed. Because an obsessed human being, if the whole world around you is blowing the f*** up, you're going to get your shit in. No matter what happens in life, no matter what you're going through, you're going to get your shit in. You're going to figure out the time to get it in. You're going to make the time to get it, whether it be a workout, whether it be work, whether it be family, whatever the f*** it may be, you're never going to have an excuse to not get your shit in. So I became obsessed. So obsessed is different than the, the, the motivational talk they get people get. Yes. A so, motivational talk is just that. You know, you yeah. go into a room, somebody gives you motivation, you leave, and you forgot what the f*** they said. Good. What is, what is the cookie jar? Well, the cookie jar is something that I invented years ago also. It's basically what happens in times where, where life is kicking you in your ass. We've all gone through, even the snowflakes, they've all gone through something tough. And, but what, what happens in, in, in that horrible time of life, whatever you're going through, we forget how badass we truly are. And we allow that one situation to dominate our lives. And we forget about the big picture of life. We just focus on the one negative thing. The cookie jar is you take one second out of your life and remind yourself about how badass you are. Go back through your, fucking, you, know, through, you, know, you know, like just, just back through your resume. Oh, I went through three hell weeks. I lost 106 pounds. I went through ranger school. I went through dive school a couple of times. I was in the Air Force. I did this. I did that. You know, I got, you know, overcame bullying, overcame my dad beating the shit out of me. Oh, I can overcome this also. It's just a reminder of how badass you are as a cookie jar. Man. Josh, any comments? Man, that's good. Good, and I'm, I'm still mowing on what you were saying, Robert, about you're successful, but are you proud of yourself? You yeah. Look yourself in the mirror. David, David, Man, that, that rings for me. Yeah, David, that really hit me when you were on, uh, kind of, you know, Brian Rhodes' London Reel. He's, he's a great guy. But when you said that, I went, holy moly. It's the part that I'm not proud of is where I go, I go to war. Is that, is that basically, I mean, that is such a profound statement. Am I, I'm not proud of myself. I mean, I'm very right. successful, but not proud of myself. Well, that's when I knew when I was younger, um, I, I was very fortunate to have a horrible life. You know, people say, why the hell are you? It made me think a lot. It, it, it made me visualize what true success was. Um, I always thought growing up, man, if I had some money, you know, if I had, you know, if I had some women that loved me, whatever the f*** may have been, um, I would be successful. Um, but through the years, I started realizing that true success in life is being proud of yourself. And how I became proud of myself was, was conquering demons. There's a lot of people that I talk to nowadays who email me who are billionaires, millionaires, have everything in the world, beautiful family, beautiful wife, beautiful job, more money than they can count, eight or nine homes, 10, 15 high-end cars. And they say, but why am I f***ing miserable? I said, what the f*** have you truly done? Not the surface shit. What have you done to really put yourself out on the edge and, and, and wake up every 
waste your morning with the doubt of I might not make it. Truly, as a, as a man, most, of, most men, no matter if you're soft or whatever, what's missing in a man's life is that we are all warriors. We don't want to look at ourselves that way. But if we don't go to war with ourselves and have that one big war, we feel empty. And we don't know why we feel empty. I was fortunate enough to have several wars with myself. And when you overcome yourself over and over again, that's where you start to find that I am proud of myself. And success is not being proud of yourself. Success is, I, you know, I have a lot of things. But being proud of yourself, it really it comes down to a war against yourself that no one else may even know about. But it's a war where you come out on the other end clean as a mother. But the whole time you're going through it, you're dirty as shit. And you're fighting and you're grinding. You're fighting you're grinding. But you come out the other end saying, man, that was the biggest trophy I ever got in my entire life. But it doesn't sit on a fucking mantle. It sits in your brain. It sits in your mind. Every trophy I have, it's in my brain. I have none in my house. They all are in my mind, which is where that came from. You know, it, I, I don't have a car. I don't own a house. I, 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 I am a happy man because of all the trophies I have in my mind. And your heart. And your heart. Yes, exactly. Final, final question. What is the 40% rule? Well, the 40% rule, I could be here for an hour, but I answer it real quick. The 40% rule is... Through my life, I started realizing how fast I would quit. I would quit before I even really started something because I thought I was at my 100%. You know how a lot of cars, or at least back in the day, cars had governors on them. And when you drive in a car, let's say it has 130 on the speedometer. And you get to 92 miles an hour and that car starts to kind of put out on you. And it can't go any faster because the factory put a governor on that car so what happens is you take the governor off that car can go probably 120 hey, maybe not 130 but 120 what we do in life is we put these governors in the factory if not Toyota if not Mercedes if not BMW the factory is us we put these governors on our brain and whenever we start to feel insecure a little bit of pain self-doubt all those words that make you feel like shit, that, that make you think you're not good enough, the best thing we do is we quit. And that happens between 40 to 60% of our effort. So we throw in the f***ing towel. The 40% rule is you don't gain 60% overnight. What you do is you keep on pushing past that 40%. By 1%, 2%, 3%, 5%, 10%. Every week, every other week, you, you go to where you stopped last time, whatever it may be, and then, but you got to get to that point where you want to stop. And then that's when this begins. You get to where you want to stop, and then that's when this begins. Go another 5% more. What happens to your mind is your mind starts to it stops feeling sorry for itself. It realizes the mind is the most powerful weapon in the world. Why? Because it knows all your insecurities. It knows all your doubts. It knows all your imperfections. And it leads you there, and it, and it, and it doesn't want to go there. The mind is the most powerful weapon because it controls you. Until you control it, that is when everything changes. So once you start to tell your mind, look, motherfucker, I'm not done yet. I don't stop when I'm tired. I stop when I'm done. And when you keep this going, you go past that 40% to 50% to 60%. Pretty soon you know you're at 99%. And 100% is obviously you're dead. But the whole thing about it is you have to learn to control your mind versus your mind controlling you. Amen. 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 Hey David, uh, I really, I, I'll say this again: you, you, and your book are the perfect people at the perfect time. You know, so 
please, uh, everybody, we all have that weak person inside of us. You know, get the book. It's the most important book you can read at this time, at this time in history. Final words, sir, Josh, for David? Yeah, that was spot on. Great timing for this in my life as well, because I, I battle with the snowflake inside of me daily. Um, and I'm, I'm blessed, I say that, to have a, a rough history and to be driven, to have that, that drive inside of me. Uh, and I really like uh, what you're saying, David. And it may remind me of Muhammad Ali. Someone asked him once, well, how many sit-ups do you do when you train? He goes, I don't know. I don't start counting until it hurts. Right. And that would remind exactly. me. It's like, man, when, it, when the pressure's on, when you want to stop, that's when it just began. So solid, man. Appreciate it. Great stuff. So, David, thanks. Thank you guys so much. I got one snowflake question for you because it's kind of with me. You know, you say a lot of things that are counter to our culture today, to our, our PC, politically correct culture. Right. Do you have people who come after you because of that? Oh, yeah. I have a lot of people that come after me. I have a lot of people that do not like me. And I like that. I absolutely invite them to continue coming after me. Because all that tells me is exactly what I thought a long time ago. I used to be just like them. I used to be just like them. People who come after people like me, people who are raw and honest, they come after me because they don't like themselves. They come after me because what I'm saying to you is hurting your feelings because it's true about who you are as a person. You might be lazy. You might be insecure. You might have some problems with yourself and in your life, and you're not willing to fix them. So Merry Christmas. <laughs> People like David God can do it this. And I will exist for the rest of the time I'm alive and I'm breathing. Because guess what? The only way you're going to fix yourself, people that don't mind my message are the people that have already gone to war with themselves and say, you know what? i got to fix myself. Because all I'm saying is, I'm not saying I'm better than you. All I'm saying is, I was once you and probably worse than you. And how I fixed myself was I became raw and honest about I was a piece of shit. And I'm not going to say, oh, no, I wasn't dumb. I just didn't try hard enough. No, I was a dumb mother. <laughs> and I didn't try hard enough. And that's okay to call yourself out. It's okay to be mean to yourself if it's warranted. But, yes, people don't like me. But guess what? Like I said before, once you like yourself, everybody else can go to hell. <laughs> hey, David, David, thank Good. you very, very much for Can't Hurt Me. Again, it's David Goggins, G-O-G-G-I-N-S, the perfect book, perfect message, perfect person at the perfect time. Thank you again, David. Hey, thank you, guys. Have a good one. Thank you. And then, Josh, Thanks. if you could stand behind, well, I want to talk about addictions because I think that's one of the big things we all face. So when we come I back, sure we, uh, Josh is going to stay with us, and we're going to go more into addictions because we're all addicted to something. So when we come back, we're going to, going to the most popular part of our program, which is Ask Robert. And once again, thank you, David Coggins. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Robert Kiyosaki, The Rich Dad Show, the good news and bad news about money. And you can listen to this program anytime, anywhere on iTunes and, 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 or Android, and all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. And we archive them for one reason, so you can listen to it again. Again, we, we at Rich Dad make no financial recommendations, or we don't hand out advice. But we do recommend you listen to these programs again, because they're really about you. And today's program is very, very, our special guest is David Goggins, G-O-G-G-I-N-S, former Navy SEAL. His book is called Can't Hurt Me, Master Your Mind and Defy the Odds. And I just absolutely love what he had to say, because... I am personally just sick and tired of snowflakes. I'm sick and tired of being politically correct. I mean, I told this Rodney Dangerfield joke, and I got nailed for How dare you say that? Well, 20 years ago, I could say it. Everybody laughed. Now you get criticized. They attack you on social media. I mean, what has happened to us? Why are kids such I can't stand it. And why do our schools have these safe rooms or whatever they have? What the heck are we doing? And it, it personally disturbs me, and even in my company, I'm not allowed to say stuff. I go, oh my God, I might hurt people's feelings. Well, if I hurt your feelings, you're already hurt. 
Because I can't hurt you unless you've already been hurt. You know, that's what David is saying, Conkins. So again, his book is called You Can't Hurt Me. Please get the book. It's worth reading. And then you can submit your questions. So we're going to the Ask Robert part, but you can submit your questions to askrobert at richdadradio.com. So Josh Lennon is a rich dad advisor, social, social entrepreneur. And Josh has, you know, I don't know why Josh does it, but he puts himself through these programs like he goes through the Navy SEALs programs and all that just to test himself, which as a former Marine, I would never do that. I'd rather <laughs> sleep in my bed with the with the wimp inside of me. But anyway, uh, Josh, what did you think of David's comments? I mean, you can you can use it in your addiction center, right? <laughs> well, I, I think it's fantastic because he's right. It's the battles within our own minds. And, uh, you know, every day it's who's going to win. Every it's it's almost like a AA program. It's a one day at a time program, even a one moment at a time. Who's right. going to show up? The the winner or the wimp? Right. Uh, so I think his message is is spot on. And to your point, in thinking about what we can say and can't say in our companies, I mean, we're at a point in my business as well as we're building a new building, and with the general contractor, he was asking me about the bathrooms, neutral, gender neutral. I'm like, are we really having this conversation? There's a female bathroom and there's a male bathroom. Well, you should be careful about that. I'm like, oh my gosh. It's just, that's how far things have gone. Um, and it's not right or wrong. It's just like, it's just ridiculous how far it's gone. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the things that, you know, Josh has been with me for 20 something years with the Rich Dad companies, the culture has got to change inside our companies. We can't change the world, but we can change ourselves and we can change the culture within which our companies operate. And so just recently I had the, our company listen to um, Dalio, Ray Dalio, he, taught, he was doing a talk at Stanford. It was really, really good talk, Josh. You know, it's it about stabbing people in the back and saying things and all this wimpy ass crap that has permeated society. So the decision I made is that if I can't change the world, you know, you want to use the women's toilet, go ahead, knock yourself out. I don't really right. care. Right. I don't really care. But I don't know why it's a political issue. That's the other part of it. But the That's thing the I can exactly. control, I can control is what goes as an entrepreneur, what goes on, what culture do I have in my own company? And that's what I'm going to take back. Does that make sense to you, Josh? It does, absolutely. Yeah. If I have to live in fear of being sued all the time within my own company, and as you know, I've been sued a number of times inside my own company by my own employees, I'm going, why am I, why am I giving you a paycheck? Why? Well, and with companies, look at two things. If they have high turnover, one or two reasons. One, the leadership sucks. It's just a bad company. Or two, the company has high standards. So if you have a culture of personal development, business development, high standards, we're professionals at our job, people don't like that. And no. they're like, well, that's not what I signed up for. I no. just want a paycheck, collect some money, and go home. Yep. It's like, no, that's not who we are. No. It's not what we do here. So anyway, I mean, that's one of the, the beauties of being an entrepreneur. We have the ability, without being illegal, immoral, and unethical, we can make changes to what we do inside our companies, and I think, or in our families too. And like you were talking about how you, you go to a battle with, for your son because he goes to school and they call the cops on him now. I mean, there is something really, really sick about that whole society we're in right now. What has happened to us? So anyway, we're now into Ask Robert. Again, I want to thank David Goggins, G-O-G-G-I-N-S, can't hurt me. And I love his attitude. Say what you have to say to me, you can't hurt me. Melissa, what's the first question for Ask Robert? Our first question today comes from Quinn in Phoenix, Arizona. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. What are the things you do, Robert, to stay mentally engaged and strong in your businesses after all these years? Well, the reason I like David, that's a big question, is because I go into the wimp myself. I have a wimp, I have a victim, I have the loser inside of me, and I have to do battle with him also. I mean, the the part of me that's really, really wimpy and nasty and small and petty, it's not a, not a pretty picture. So I, I mean, that's why I love Coggins' book. Coggins' book, you know, I listen to his books on tape. He's on London Reel. There's a lot of, a lot of YouTube videos on him because, you know, he is the leader today. 
because we have a bunch of freaking wimps running the show right now. I mean, it is horrible, horrible, horrible. Any comments on that, Josh? How do you keep going? Well, just like you mentioned, the, the shield training, um, you know, I, I sign up for that kind of stuff, special ops training or uh, CrossFit or competitions or jujitsu competitions. I do things that I'm scared of and that make me uncomfortable because I'm scared of them. And just like Dave's saying, you kind of lean in and face your demons. And that's why I've gotten on stage and spoke with you is because I was deathly afraid of public speaking. I'd rather get in a fist fight with someone than publicly speak. So it's like, how do I stay engaged? Is like when I find myself being comfortable, it's like, okay, what's the next challenge? How can I push myself? What's something that I'm, I'm scared to death of doing, but I know that I'm gonna grow from it. And when I face that challenge, it changes everything in my life. Uh, and that's where personal development is so important to keep growing, keep evolving, and keep changing. Amen, brother. Amen, and it's our, and and that's what your. Uh, would you tell a little a little bit about uh, your program in San San Antonio? How do you guys do it? Yeah, you start? So we, my wife and I, Lisa, teamed up. Best partner I've ever had, Tom Spooner. He's a retired Tier One operator, Delta Force. So the elite, elite one percent of the army will ever get there. Um, teamed up with him, and we formed Warriors Heart. It's a private inpatient treatment center for our active military, for our veterans, and our first responders. So just that warrior class. So that was a conscious decision. As I've been in treatment center in, in the addiction field for you know, 18 years, I don't really resonate. I don't connect with the snowflake. I connect with the warrior class. That's who I am. That's my core. So that's who we treat. That's our population. So we speak to that warrior. Our programs are designed around like a training course from detox to inpatient treatment, outpatient. And the guys come here and they're like, man, this, there's nothing like this out here anywhere. I'm like, Roger, that we know. That's why we built it. And it's working. Uh, because, because, as you know, there's a huge problem, uh, opiate problem, addiction problem, alcohol. So we're facing that. And, you know, I mean, wouldn't you say a lot of reason for this drug addiction, opiate problem, and most of the treatment centers is they actually treat them like snowflakes anyway. They do. I mean, the, the idea is hang up your guns. That's something you did in your past. Embrace civilian world. And let's go around the campfire and sing Kumbaya. Because most of the counselors are not warriors themselves. No. So they don't understand that person. No. So they're trying to convert them to who they are. And it's like, no. It's, it's, it's absolutely disgusting. And, you know, did you see that they just passed a law now that kids can now have anxiety days and mental health days off? <laughs> it's so crazy. Uh, I mean, I, I can't believe it, you know. Every day I have mental health life. issues. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, welcome to my world. Life. Try go, Try starting your own company. You, you're definitely psychotic every single day of the year and dealing with people. Oh, my God. <laughs> you, you have to be. I mean, one, you're crazy to be an employee. I mean, I love my employees, but you got to be crazy to do that just from a tax purpose reason. And yep. then you have to be psychotic to be an entrepreneur to yep. take on that, uh, that challenge. Right. <laughs> Anyway, with that, uh, we have a we have, we, we we're, we're receiving a lot of questions. You know, is there a correlation between this gap between the rich and poor, but also is that does that seep over into the opioid, or the alcoholism, or the sex addictions industry, which you're in? There's not 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 that you're in sex addiction, but addictions industry. So, Melissa, you have yeah, questions on addiction. Yeah, yeah. This question, Roberts, for both you and Josh. This comes from Kevin in Los Angeles, favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And he does ask, is there a correlation between the economy and the opioid crisis? And do you think there's really a way to stop the epidemic? Well, I see I see issues there, you know, like people now want more money and work less. I don't, you know, that doesn't fit my thing. Or we're now going to a thing called MMT, Modern Money Theory. Whereas we bailed out the banks, which I disagree with, but that's what they did. Now everybody else wants to get bailed out. So we have Bernie Sanders and AOC and uh, Elizabeth Warren. We've got to give everybody everything. 
And I'm going, wait a minute, what happened to capitalism? So I think there's a there's a correlation between a bad economy, not a bad economy, but a trying economy where you gotta make changes and addictions. Any comments on that, Josh? Yeah, a little bit of a different approach on that, and that's a great question, Kevin. Because um, when times are up, you think of the roaring 20s. People are partying, people are spending, they're just going to town, having a great time. Now when things are down, people, instead of partying, they're using. So it's a different type of consumption, but they're still consuming because they're drinking because they're depressed or they're taking pills because life's not working out or they got laid off. So either way, it's kind of like a recession-proof industry. Either way, based on human behavior, we're going to use it when times are up or we're going to party when times are up and we're going to use when times are down. At, to what levels? To a degree, yes, I think there's more heavier use uh, when times are down. So that's when you see people going from, say, the prescription drugs to heroin. Because it's, it's prescription drugs are more expensive than heroin. So you see a shift. That we do see a shift uh, with the economy when it comes to, is it uh, prescription drugs or is it heroin? just in the, the realm of this opiate addiction uh, or epidemic. But isn't it, a, in, isn't it an addiction the need to get happy again, to get high, to feel good about yourself? Well, it, I mean, when life happens, it happens to all of us, when we feel uncomfortable, like in a social situation, we're taught, oh, have a drink, relax, you know, shake it off, you know, be more social. <clears throat> so we're taught socially right out of gate is that when you're uncomfortable, start drinking, to start medi using. You if, you, if you have pain, take drugs. Right. Yeah, the medical industry is that's what it is. Is you're un, you're unhappy or you're in pain. Let me give you a drug. So because a quiet patient is a happy patient. So if you're no longer complaining, then they're, they're risk adverse to lawsuits. Now, I'm not saying all medical providers, but there are a number of them out there that. They're more scared about being sued than they are actually treating the root cause of the problem. Right, so they do whatever they do not to get sued, even though it's the wrong treatment. Exactly. So, so people are using drugs to not feel life and not deal with life. That's what we do. We escape. Yeah. It's either food, eating, I mean, food, sex, spending. I mean, Amazon's a perfect example of that. Things out of control because... Uh, life sucks. Let me go buy a couple things. Now I feel a little better because better I got a dope of, I got a, a spike of dopamine because I just hit send. You know, it's it's all around us. Right. But, but I, I did a talk the other day to a bunch of millennials, and I talked about how drug addiction begins in schools. And you have a perfect son for this whole thing. Is today, in our school system, you know, the school system is the only business that blames the customer for their incompetence. In other words, they drug kids, they give them Ritalin today if the kid is bored. You know, when I say ADD, it was just a case of extreme boredom. That's all it was for me. And so in my opinion, our school systems are pushing drugs on kids with all these other things. I mean, isn't, isn't your son in danger of that? Perfect example, absolutely. You know, schools in Arizona, it was we got to get him on drugs. He's got to see the staff psychologist. Riddling, you know, ADD, ADHD. And I know from personal experience, that was my story. I'm like, ah, that's not going to happen. So when we moved to Texas, what was great is the Texas teachers like, hey, Jake, settle down. No, go run some laps. And they called me and said, I just want to let you know, Mr. Lannon, we had your son run some laps. I go, really? Okay, how's he doing now? He's doing great. I go, feel free to do that at any time. Right. Because they understand it a little bit differently. Right. I just can't, I mean. I love it. Yeah. And then, you know, like my, you know, you, you've met my friend, General Bergman, right, three-star, and now a congressman. He was saying that they couldn't get great, they couldn't get pilots qualified to fly for the military because they had Ritalin in school. In other words, because wow. of their, because of what the drugs they took in school, legal drugs, the Marine wow. Corps disqualified them. Any comments on that? Wow. It, it's, it's a broken system, and that's how they know how to deal with it, is to drug them up. That must be the answer, right? Because 
That's what the professionals are saying to do. But it's not the answer. It just makes the problem worse, and we're setting the stages with our kids, our most precious assets in the world. We're setting them up for failure. We're not letting them experience, you know, loss. We're not, we're, we're drugging them up. We're putting them in an environment where we're drinking and partying and doing stupid stuff. So, of course, they're going to be soft when they come out, and they're going to turn to drugs and alcohol as a, as a possible solution. And then now they're and now they're having days off, not for illness, but for anxiety, mental health. I t- tell you what, it's uh, I mean, again. I want to thank you, Josh, and thanks for doing your work with Warriors Heart. And how can people get in touch with you? Thank you, appreciate that. It's WarriorsHeart.com. Uh, we have all of our information there. We run a twenty-four hour help hotline. You know someone that's struggling with chemical dependency that's of a warrior, uh, active military, veteran, first responders, police officers, firefighters. We are the only licensed, accredited treatment center that's, that's serving that population. Uh, and it's, we're really doing a lot of good work. And thank you for doing that great work. And again, I want to thank David Goggins, G-O-G-G-I-N-S, and Can't Hurt Me. I thank all of you for submitting your questions to Ask Robert at richdadradio.com. And I thank you for all listening to today's program on Rich Dad Radio. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Josh. Thanks, Robert. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.